Okay, so this is what I have as in terms of um, my radiochemistry background and my interest in radioactivity and drinking water. Uh, the second part of my talk will be geological applications. So now I'm looking at radioisotopes to study some geological processes in nature. And when we do this, again, we rely on disequilibrium. When, when we have when we have equilibrium, the parent and the product are in equal concentrations. When we have this equilibrium, either of them is either missing or in higher concentration or lower than it's supposed to be based on radioactive decay um, loads. So I put uh, quickly here a schematic of the main isotopes that are used for specifically in coastal areas and um, water system at the land ocean interface and um, we usually use uh, isotopes from the uranium 258 series that I showed you before so it's part uranium is part of the composition of the aquifer usually decays through reactions to uranium 234 eventually gets dissolved through weathering processes as uranium carbonate this is the main species in seawater that we see and we also have some thorium, which decays, um, and part of thorium is very particle active, and which means is that the moment it gets in water produced from uh, uranium, it's scavenged by the particles and settles on the floor and then decays in the sediment. And <coughs> part of it. Excuse me. Um, part of uh, the radium-226, the product of it, will stay in the water. It's two valent ion, and it's usually dissolved and stay in there, and it will produce some radium as well. And this radium will decay, and it will produce all these polonium and lead isotopes. And they will be both in seawater and in the sediment, because part of our thorium was scavenged in the sediment and it uh, produced the decay series. And so <coughs> we will have orphaned those thorium isotopes because they were removed from the system or disequilibrium. And the same for radon, the products of uh, radium-226. Radon is a gas, part of it will decay, uh, part of it, it will be gas from the water and gets into the atmosphere, and then it will decay there, and it will produce polonium, which polonium is like thorium, it likes particles, it will attach to particles, and then with the rainfall, it will settle <coughs> through the water column. Excuse me. <coughs> and then <coughs> this orphan polonium will settle with particles on the ocean floor as well. And it will start decaying because it won't be supporting the radium isotopes are somewhere in the water. So we have all these very many different situations of um, disequilibrium. And the main reason for disequilibrium is some chemical or um, physical reactions that happen that remove either the daughter or the parent. And we'll start seeing these uh, disequilibriums. And so how do we use this? There are mainly <coughs> two methods. The uh, first type of methods are based on the decay of the unsupported radioactive daughter. If the parent is scavenged by particles, say in the case of thorium-230, radium will stay in the water and it will decay. And it won't be supported, it won't be produced anymore because the thorium is missing, right? So we have unsupported daughter that decays. I'll show you some example of radium unsupported when we use in coastal areas. And the other method is when we have ingrowth, when we have the parent which um, it has higher or longer half-life and it will start producing the product, the daughter. So two groups of methods. And so we use different isotopes depending of their half-life and the processes we are looking at. Usually in coastal areas, when we look at mixing of seawater and freshwater, the time <coughs> range is in 
um, 10 to 20 days. So we want to pick up the isotope which is, has this half-life because we can use it only until five half-lives. After that, it will decay completely, and we won't see the difference between the parent and the daughter, and we cannot use it as an radio clock. And just an example, for example, carbon-14 can be used to date materials up to 30,000 um, years, because the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,000 years, totally. <coughs> this is an example of unsupported daughter and you probably know this a very, very common method for to um, <coughs> date sediments and calculate sedimentation rates in marine and lake sediments. So we have a lot of unsupported lead to 10. Remember when we go back to this figure, we have, rad uh, we have polonium isotopes that are products of radon which was in the atmosphere and it produces more polonium than we have radium in the water column. So this polonium is particle active and it will settle with the new sediment when sediment is accumulated. And it will start decaying because the radium is not there. The radium is somewhere in the water. So we have very high concentrations of fresh deposit sediment of, with polonium and lead isotopes. And when we look at a profile, <coughs> it will look like this. This is depth in the sediment, polonium and lead concentration in the surface, which we call this as an orphan or excess of polonium. And because it's insupported, it will start decaying with that old sediment, new sediment. And then it will reach to a level which will be in equilibrium with the radium which is in the uh, sediment. We have some radium which is um, naturally in there from the series. And then <coughs> we use simple decay of loads and we can calculate the time since, uh, when this, depo this sediment was deposited. We usually, well, and then we can assign ages to these um, sediments. So when we usually we do this, we also use uh, the peak of cesium-137 which is around 1965, when we had the peak and, and the nuclear bombs explosion, to reference these days that we uh, calculate with the lead to 10 method. So how would, uh, I'm, sure, I'm gonna show you an example of uh, dating pit accumulation rates in Alberta and Canada. <coughs> this is an area with discontinuous permafrost, and we had, um, a core so, uh, collected by people and um, the institution there, and we had to do, we had to calculate um, accumulation rates. The way we did it, so these are the peak cores, and we, they are separated and, and calculated inventories for each of those, and then we electro deposited the polonium isotopes on silver discs, and we use alpha spectrometry. This is, um, again, pixel detector is an octet. And these are these small pieces here. If you can see anything. Then we get an alpha um, <coughs> spectrum. We use polonium on nine as a tracer because we dissolve this peat. And so we need to uh, monitor our chemical yield. So we put some polonium on nine to uh, be able to calculate the chemical yield and final concentration. And we can also do this using, without dissolving the sediment or the peat through gamma spectrometry. And we did part of it to determine the cesium concentrations, this reference peak that we want to know. This is again our well detector in Florida. And so these are some of the results. So these are two different cores and in depth up to, up to 40 centimeters. And the diamonds here is lead to 10 concentration. As you see, um, these are uh, uh, inductivity and DPM per grams with assigned ages based on the lead to 10 model. 
So higher concentrations in the surface, then it, the isotope decays, and uh, lower concentrations that would be equal to the radium in this pit. And then the star um, plot shows the concentration of cesium-157, and so obviously we did a very good job because our peak in cesium-157 coincide with the date we determined by the lead to 10 method at 965. And this is another shorter core that we did there. 